right, guys, how y'all doing today? Let me get this camera straightened out here. Hope everyone's having a great evening. Welcome to the Forbidden Knowledge Podcast, okay? I'm using a little bit of a new camera here, so I'm trying to just get the alignment proper and get it right. It works a little bit differently than the other one that I had, uh, but I will get it right. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. I had to push it back 15 minutes and get a 15-minute later start just to make sure I had the, uh, the technology and everything else working properly. It's going to be a great night. going to talk about the Anunnaki. Did they masquerade as gods on earth? And so we're going to dig into a couple of things tonight. We're going to talk about uh, the origins of the Anunnaki. Who are the Anunnaki? What are Anunnaki? What does that term, what does that name actually mean? And where do they come from? I'm going to talk on that real briefly tonight. I can't go in too deep because I can talk about this for five hours, which I've done before, and still wouldn't cover all of it. So I'm going to do my best to summarize it in a way that uh, everyone can grasp and understand the basic fundamentals of this, uh, where they came from, who they are, and then also uh, what records do we have of them on earth uh, that they came here uh, and that they masqueraded as gods. And so we're going to look into that tonight. All right. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, being here. I'm, I'm connected on uh, looks like one, two, three, four, five Facebook pages that I run as well as YouTube and two verified Twitter accounts. So I'm on two verified Facebook pages an Anunnaki history page, a um, forbidden knowledge uh, Egypt page, and of course, uh, my Billy Carson uh, personal account, as well as two Twitter accounts, my Billy Carson verified Twitter, my Billy, my forbidden knowledge verified Twitter, and of course, my YouTube account. So thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, it's going to be a great talk. <clears throat> We're going to get into it here. I'm actually, as you guys know, the way I like to present, I like to bring the receipt. So I will have my PowerPoint open <clears throat> because I like to provide sources of information so that everyone can see where I'm getting, <clears throat> where I'm getting my data from. <clears throat> Been talking all day and screaming all day. So give me a sec, give me a second. <clears throat> all right. So I just got off of a very late podcast last night with Jimmy Church. And I've been grinding all day long, as you can see. And, um, you know, it just, it just never ends. There's just more and more to do. As soon as I get off of this podcast, <clears throat> I have to hop on another podcast uh, with Elizabeth. We're going to do the Biohack Your Best Life series right after this at around 9.15. So stay tuned and make sure you stay close by your device because we're coming right back on to talk about mushrooms and fungi. And we're going to go into another deep scientific presentation on that as well. All right. <clears throat> All right, guys. I see everyone here in the chat. Thank you for the chat donations already. I already see a couple coming, and I really appreciate that. All this, all the chat money, all the chat donations go to help underprivileged privileged children. So we appreciate you. Uh, thank you, Randy Tardiff. Much appreciated. All right. And we're going to go ahead and get on into it. <clears throat> Let me share uh, this PowerPoint presentation. And uh, let's get this party started, guys. <clears throat> All right. First and foremost, you know, I got to make my shameless plug and get that out of the way in the beginning. <laughs> my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, is still a bestseller now. It's a bestseller in five countries. All right. Right now, it's uh, number one or number two in the United States. It keeps jostling, jostling between one and two. One day, maybe number one for three or four days, and then it'd be going number two for two or three days, and it goes back to number one. But it's been number one and number two for a very, very long time. Okay, so check it out on Amazon.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.com with the number four. That's available in both locations. <clears throat> this book is about ancient civilizations. In particular, this guy right here, Thoth the Atlantean. <clears throat> All right. Now, what gives me the credibility to talk on this topic? <clears throat> That's what a lot of people want to know. <clears throat> Excuse me. They want to know what gives me the credibility. What, why is it that I can talk on this topic uh, so deeply? Uh, and why have I spent so much time, you know, researching this topic? <clears throat> well, the first, the first thing is 
I started off researching technology very long time ago, very, very long time ago. And researching technology and different types of advanced technologies and black budget technologies and top secret technologies, I began to realize a connection between ancient civilizations and anomalies on other planets and moons based on space probe data. <clears throat> so I made the connection and I began to realize that the people that the ancients, our ancestors were talking about, were super advanced and had advanced technologies. And they literally, not all of them, but some of them literally walked this planet and masqueraded as gods. <clears throat> um, and we're going to go into that tonight. But my what gives me the credibility behind that is the fact that not only did I come up with these connections, but I, I decided to travel the planet on my own on my own budget, on my own dollar, out of my own pocket, no sponsors, to travel the planet myself. And I've been traveling this planet for a very long time. My first trip out of the country to an ancient site was over 25 years ago. I went to Teotihuacan and I went to Chichen Itza down in the Yucatan Peninsula and Teotihuacan up in near Mexico City. And uh, I went to go see the Mayan pyramid structures, not all of them, but the majority of them. And that was my first trip out of the, out of the country to go visit ancient sites. And uh, that got me hooked. I knew right away that's pretty much what I wanted to, wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I've been on a quest to do that ever since. This picture here, you see me inside of the Great Pyramid. I'm actually inside of the Great Pyramid. Uh, and you see me actually with my hand on the, my right hand is on the stone coffer inside the king's chamber, which is inside the Great Pyramid. I'm leaning on it. You can see that broken corner piece right there. That broken corner piece, due to some type of immense energy, it sent that corner piece, which is was solid granite, flying across the room to impact a wall on the other side inside the king's chamber. Whoever travels to Egypt with me, in October, there's 65 people booked. You, you guys will be going with me. We're going to go into the King's Chamber. We're going to climb inside the Great Pyramid into the King's Chamber. And then I will show you where the impact mark is on the opposite side of that chamber. That's going to blow you away, <clears throat> especially when you realize how, how hard that granite is. How What could break it and what could shoot that much granite across a room about 20 feet? <clears throat> That's incredible. And you see me there standing outside the Great Pyramid. So I'm inside the king's chamber, and one of the greatest anomalies that exist on this planet Earth is the fact that the speed of light in a vacuum is 299,792, 299,792,458 meters per second. And the geographic coordinate for the Great Pyramid of Giza is 29.979458, north. <clears throat> so what's interesting is these... This anomaly that's inside of the Great Pyramid, it's got the coordinate, the geographic coordinate, which aligns with the same digits that mark the speed of light in meters per second. That's not happenstance. That's not a coincidence. That is foreknowledge. That is pre-thought. And that is purposefully done in a way that someone in a future time, humans in a future time, which is us now, can discover this and realize that the people that were uh, operating back then were operating at a very high level and had the capability of light travel, space travel, portal travel, all that information is programmed into the Great Pyramid, okay? Technology and the Temple of Abydos. A lot of people want to try to, dis to dispute this and say, it's oh, it's just an accident. They accidentally recarved some hieroglyphs and made them look like airplanes and boats and, and helicopters. Well, that's false. Because when you go there with the guides that I go with, the homegrown guides that don't follow the mainstream, uh, you know, uh, story that they're told to give out from the from the um, people from the tourism board, uh, they follow the true history and the true information. And the fact is that the glyphs had never been touched. Now, I was in the Temple of Abydos several times. You see me standing, pointing up at these at this anomaly. What's interesting about this anomaly is this. In that temple, uh, when uh, it was taken over by the son of Seti, he, and it's, this is a ritual, you then change all the uh, engraved cartouches, all the glyphs that are cartouches, 
from the previous Pharaoh's name to your name. So that's exactly what uh, was being done there. And all of the cartouches were changed. Uh, and they're trying to say that this is just one that accidentally somehow didn't get changed the right way. Well, that's false because these pharaohs were such perfectionists. If you were the person that was in charge of changing the name of the cartouche to the new pharaoh's name and he comes back to the, to the temple and realizes his name got botched, you're a dead man. And then someone else is going to be hired immediately to fix the error. And the fact that this had never been fixed, and the reason why it was never fixed is because it was never broken. It was not a cartouche at all. The cartouches are clearly seen throughout the entire um, uh, temple complex. And you can clearly see uh, the location where the name was changed. This was never uh, a, a name change. It was never a name. It was always a depiction of technology. Uh, and so amazing things you can see and learn when you actually get out on the pound of pavement, get on airplanes and leave your zip code and go get your passport stamps. Here I am in all in Tutumbo in Peru at the top of a mountain, which is an amazing uh, shot right here. Uh, this mountain, this mountain fortress has stone, has megalithic stones nearby from where I'm standing that were that were hewn from mountains far behind me and brought to that location. There's no technology that existed to take those gigantic megalithic blocks and take them from the top of a mountain and bring them to another mountain miles and miles away. Didn't exist back then. Here I am at Machu Picchu. Uh, I took this shot uh, in Machu Picchu. Just an amazing scene there. I'm looking at the gigantic terraces. You can see some people on the left, on the left side of the photo in the center of the screen, uh, and you can see, so you can get an idea of how large these terraces were. Why were they so large and who were they so large for? And there I am standing with my guide at Saxo Uman. You can see the gigantic megalithic stone behind me. I'm six foot four. And that stone behind me is probably about nine feet uh, tall. Megalithic, super megalithic. The one to my, uh, which would be to my right, if I'm facing you guys, that super tall megalithic stone there. I mean, that is just incredible. And my guide tells me that behind these stones is gold, hidden gold. And the gold is still there. That's why the military guards it 24-7. <clears throat> Here I am again in, Cam uh, in Cambodia, in Angkor Wat. You can see the depiction of uh, dinosaurs uh, glyphed into, into the size of temples there. Right there, I'm at Ta Prom. On the left and on the right, I'm showing you the... the um, the dinosaurs. So human beings knew what dinosaurs looked like in the ancient past. Yes, dinosaurs are real. They're not fake. All these new cockamamie conspiracy theories coming up. Dinosaurs are fake. Birds don't exist and all this other crazy stuff. Listen, guys, don't listen to these people. Just get in your car and drive to a local museum. And you'll be you, you answered. You get your questions answered. Right. Stop watching these uh, these these cockamamie uh, people who don't even have a passport stamp. This is me in Cambodia. Uh, checking this stuff out. Here I am in Akrotiri in Greece in a remote island in the middle of the ocean at a ancient Atlantean city that was buried by volcanic ash. <clears throat> and I researched this city very extensively. There's high technology there. They have a construction technique that, that exists not only now today in modern times using steel rebar along with megalithic blocks. Even They even Put, had toilets that flushed from the second floor. Incredible technologies. And here I am at Teotihuacan in Mexico, standing on the top of the Pyramid of the Moon with the Pyramid of the Sun behind me. And also behind me is the Avenue of the Dead. <clears throat> and here I am in, in the uh, Yucatan at Chichen Itza at the Pyramid of Kukulkan. So again, guys, I've spent time traveling the planet. I don't want to spend too much more time on it because I can show you a million pictures from all the countries and all the places I've been to. But I want you to know that I got the credentials and I got the receipts. The receipts are in my passport. They're called stamps. I actually go out to these places in person. I don't rely on Google photos. I don't rely on YouTube videos. I don't rely on hearsay. I go in person and do the research in person for my own self, for my own knowledge and uh, study and research and deal and, and, and hang out with the, uh, with the homegrown 
you know, indigenous people and talk to them and their elders and get their side of the story. That's what I like to do. I don't go by all this hearsay, she say, and all this other kind of stuff and all these YouTube videos. I go out to the source and I also read a lot. So sometimes you have to go into a lot of in-depth research and studying through books. All right. And so I use a lot of books. And um, one thing I discovered through studying and researching the books is the Pleiadian star system. Very, very prevalent in ancient civilizations. These are the stars here. You can see the names of these stars. The Pleiades is a star cluster primarily known as seven bright stars in the sky. It's really, truly only six now. There's a whole nother video I got to make. One star ran out of fuel. But the ancient Sumerians uh, is the oldest account I can find in terms of writing talking about the Pleiadian star system. There are more ancient artifacts, some of which I have replicas of and some original pieces that also have a depiction of the Pleiadian star system etched into the actual artifact, which is pretty incredible. And so the Pleiadian star system is a powerful place, and there's one main reason. It's because according to the ancient records, there was an ancient galactic war in that sector of the galaxy. And so this war broke out between humanoids, not necessarily homo sapien like us, but still people that primarily, for the most part, look like us. They are bilateral, bipedal organisms that have hands and feet. If you cut them in half, they have two equal sides. They have a communication that's a very intelligent. And some of these uh, beings have become so intelligent, they became a spacefaring race. They had the capability of traveling in space. Now, over time, they had a great golden age in that sector of the galaxy until uh, something happened. And it's really started, according to the text that I could find, it seems to have started over some type of prejudice. Some form of prejudice creep back in to these uh, star-based civilizations, believe it or not. And then even a space religion that had creeped in. So between the space religion and the, um, uh, and the, and the racism or the, uh, it's not really kind of a racism, it's, some, it's hard to explain, but they were divided, dividing themselves amongst their belief systems and who was from what planet and who was from another planet. I guess it, you can call it still racism. Between that uh, and the space religion that formed, it destroyed the golden age. It destroyed what had been probably millions of years of peace and advancements. It destroyed it in a very short period of time. And there, a space war broke out, a galactic war between these particular um, races of people on different planets. And this is how the Anunnaki came to be. The Anunnaki, <clears throat> the term Anunnaki means people that came from heaven to earth. It doesn't specify a particular person or race of people. This is a big misconception. People tend to think that when you hear the word Anunnaki, oh, it's all white people. It's all white aliens. Oh, it's all black aliens. Oh, it's all red aliens. Oh, it's all blue aliens. No, it's all of the above. Anunnaki is anyone that comes from heaven to earth, anyone that comes from space down to this planet. It's a generalized term, just like if me, being a Floridian in the United States of America on Earth, you all have all those titles in there. When I travel from Earth and leave and go to another planet and they say, where are you from? I say, I'm an Earthling. I don't say, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Billy Carson and I'm from this planet named Earth where I live in this uh, country, a continent named North America in this country named the United States. And uh, I hail from Florida. And in Florida, I'm from this city. No, I just say earthling. Same thing with Anunnaki. The Anunnaki is a generalized term. And it means anyone that comes from any planet in the entire known universe is an Anunnaki. Just like when you travel from Earth to another planet, you're an Anunnaki. Okay? It's a generalized term. Now, beyond that term, they have a specific name for themselves. They call themselves Atlanteans. That's what they call themselves. And where do you get that? Read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. They call themselves Atlanteans. And they created, they meaning the one, this one group that came here in a particular time. Many groups had come visited to this planet. But this one particular group called themselves Atlanteans. And they created a global breakaway civilization on Earth. A global. 
Atlantis was not just a ring city in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantis was a global civilization. The ring city in the, in the Atlantic Ocean uh, that, that uh, went into war and sunk, that ring city was just one of many capitals of Atlantis that existed on Earth. Just like in the United States, every state has a state capital. But Atlantis was a global civilization that had capitals in different regions of the planet. And the ring city was just one of many that uh, existed at the time. And they all went to battle against each other because these people liked to fight. They had a weapon in that sector of the galaxy in the Pleiadian star system. It was called the, the Brahmastra, okay? And the Astra. It's a celestial weapon created by Lord Brahma and it's sometimes known as the Brahma Astra. It's a it's referred to a, a, as a missile weapon or a, a weapon that was kind of con uh, identical to what we would call a missile or a ballistic missile, right? A weapon that can travel uh, from one location on the planet up into space and come down in another place and then completely decimate it. Uh, and it says when the Brahma Astra was discharged, Neither counterattack nor defense of any kind can stop it. There was nothing you can do to stop this weapon. Once it was unleashed, that was it. It was the end. Whatever the target was, was obliterated. There was no way to stop this, uh, this ballistic, okay, this missile. And so this was also used in another type of a weapon that can actually control and destroy planets. They actually had a weapon, they said, that can destroy any man on three worlds. So imagine you're in the sector of the Pleiadian star system and there's this galactic war going on. And then all of a sudden, planets and moons are being blown up. You have these massive chunks of planetary and moon debris floating through the, your area, your region, your sector of the galaxy, crashing into other planets, creating global catastrophes on other planets, because that would be like asteroid strikes or, you know, it'd be massive, massive, massive um, uh, global uh, uh, disasters happening simultaneously. And so if you're on a planet in that sector, the only thing you can do is flee and try to find somewhere else to live. So this created something called space refugees. There were space refugees, people fleeing from that Pleiadian star cluster system and looking for new stars with new planets to go inhabit. They became space refugees. They found Orion, they found Aldebaran, they found... Uh, um, uh, Zeta Reticulus, they, they found uh, Sirius, A, B, and C. They found all these other star systems to go and inhabit. They also, some landed on a, a planet named Nibiru that actually orbits a brown dwarf star that orbits our sun. And so that's where you get the Nibiru story, which is in the Enumi Elish, which I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight. All right. So they had these weapons just like the one in Star Wars. They had planetary destroyers. They had Death Stars. So they call them in Star Wars a Death Star. Well, they had Death Stars. They had these, and, and these Death Stars, remnants of them still exist in our solar system. If you look at uh, a couple of the moons that exist, like Io, you, re you re begin to realize that, not Io, I'm sorry, not Io, but um, uh, what's the name of that moon? It's, there's one called Mimas. And there's another moon in our solar system, Iapetus. So those two moons, Iapetus and Mimas, those two moons are artificial moons in our solar system. They actually have a very thick rim going around the entire equator, like two pieces uh, of a gigantic device put together. And uh, one of them even has the octagonal shape on it that looks a very, very similar to what, what uh, Star Wars calls the Death Star. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. I mean, this stuff just is just mind-blowing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I believe that those are remnants of ancient weapons that even exist in our solar system. Now, let me continue here. I'm going to talk a little bit about, after I mention this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Enuma Elish. But where did all this, this these, these modern weapons we have now come from? They came from ancient text. This is Robert J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. OK, how did he learn about making this atomic bomb? It wasn't from Albert Einstein. Yes, Albert Einstein would talk about the theory of splitting atoms. He tried to tell everybody, don't even try because it's going to become a deadly force on Earth. 
Albert Einstein did not create nuclear weapons. That's a big falsehood. This is the man who did it, J. Robert Oppenheimer. In an interview about the first test of the atomic bomb, first televised in 1965 as part of a documentary called The Decision to Drop the Bomb, Oppenheimer remarked that upon seeing the test, he thought, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He was quoting from the 1944 Bra Havamanda, and that comes from the Mahabharata, okay? So he's literally uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. I'm sorry, the Bhagavad Gita. He's literally quoting from ancient texts where they talk about these weapons. These scientists, these mad scientists, go and reconstruct weapons based off of ancient texts and other technologies as well. So you can see the places that they fled to. Sirius, Orion's Belt, Aldebaran, Hades, Pleiades is where they originally came out of trying to flee and find new places to live. Uh, because why? That area, that region was no good anymore. And the one planet, like I said, that's on a very strange orbit around our sun is called Nibiru. It orbits a brown dwarf star that orbits our sun in a very strange elliptical orbit because it's, it's, it's orbiting a star that's as not only is it a failed star, in other words, it's a brown dwarf. It, it has the same gravitational forces that are, as our main white star that we have in the center of our solar system. However, uh, it's much smaller, but it has six planets orbiting it, and one of those planets is named Nibiru, and it's on a very strange elliptical orbit because it was captured by our solar system gravitationally. The sources for the information that I just talked about in regards to the, the galactic war and the Pleiades comes from this, these sources right here. I always have the receipts. Burnham Celestial Handbook, all right, star names, their lore and meaning, star lore of all ages, star tales, the age of fable, the Greek myths, the reader's encyclopedia, and there's the one from uh, William Rose Bennett, 1965, American Heritage Dictionary, 1965, Fundamentals of Physics, David Halliday, and Robert Resnick, 1986. All right. Now let's talk about the Enuma Elish, Seven Tablets of Creation. The Seven Tablets of Creation. This is where the majority of the Old Testament, you hear me always talking about this, the majority of the Old Testament comes from the Enuma Elish. I'm not going to read the Enuma Elish today, but I am going to go through the history of it a little bit so you can understand what I'm talking about, God's masquerading, I mean, um, uh, the Anunnaki, I'm sorry, masquerading as gods on earth, okay? These are the actual tablets. You can see on them, there's cuneiform writing etched into these stone tablets. Why did they do it this way? Why not paper? Because paper, over time, as you all know, it disintegrates. Everyone's, oh, steel disintegrates. They knew that stone can persist for tens of thousands of years under the right conditions. Everything else pretty much succumbs to the environment. And so we have these stones, we have the writing, and they've been deciphered for a very, very long time. They were not deciphered by Zachariah Sitchin. Zachariah Sitchin used the existing translations that already existed. He did not translate the Enuma Elish. That's, a, that's another fake news story. Zachariah Sitchin uh, was one of the greatest researchers to ever live. And why? Because he was able to take all these ancient texts and tablets and scriptures and, 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 and put them all together and create stories out of them for us to understand what might have happened back then. Is his ex are his stories exactly correct down to the T? Probably not. But it's, uh, you know, no one, none of, no one's is. He got the fundamental basis of the story accurate. The fact that beings came here from somewhere else, engaged mankind at some point, mined this planet for resources, created a breakaway civilization, then enslaved mankind, and then began to go to war against one another. His story is sound, okay? So we have the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation. So the Enuma Elish is the Babylonian creation myth, and it was recovered by Austin Henry Layard in 1849 in the ruined library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh, which is now known as Moscow, Iraq, and published by George Smith in 1876. Guys, Zachariah Sitchin wasn't even born yet. <laughs> he wasn't even in the... Uh, his father's family jewels yet <laughs> swimming around. Okay. So for all the people that try to say, oh, this, this, the, these tablets, no, these tablets have been well documented and well translated long before Zachariah Sitchin was even 
born and he never translated any tablets and never claimed to be a translator. He was a person that was just using existing translations to create uh, books out of them to try to piece together uh, to, at the best of his ability what may have happened in the ancient past. The Enuma Elish has about a thousand lines and is recorded in old Babylonian on seven clay tablets, each holding between 115 and 170 lines of Sumero Akkadian cuneiform script. Most of Tablet 5 had never been recovered until recently, and Tablet 5 was discovered at the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq. We now have Tablet number 5, and fully translated as well. This epic is one of the most important sources of understanding the Babylonian worldview centered on the supremacy of Marduk, a.k.a. Amun-Ra, one of the gods of the Bible, and the creation of humankind for the service of the gods. Its primary original purpose, however, is not an exposition of theology or theology, but an elevation of Marduk. Okay, he wanted to be elevated as a chief god of Babylon above all other Mesopotamian gods. This is the man that said, and I do mean man, that said, there'll be no other gods but me, and I am a jealous god. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound familiar to you guys? There will be no other God but me, and I am a jealous God. All right? Let's see what um, let's see what verse that is in the Bible. That's Exodus twenty, three through five. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is what God is saying in the New Testament. But guess what, guys? <laughs> Sorry, that's Marduk. That ain't the God you think that created the universe that has all the blessings and won't he do it and all that guy. That ain't him. That's a faker. That's the masquerader. Okay. A lot of his words made it into the Bible. He also said, I am a jealous God. Let's check that out. I am a jealous God. Why, why would God have to be jealous? If you can create everything and you know everything, why you got to be jealous? Why you got human types of emotions going on and you supposed to be the almighty. Okay. Exodus 25, all right? God is a jealous God. Oh, why? Why is God a jealous God? For the Lord thy, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Least the anger of the Lord God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from the face of the earth. And God, like I said before in one of my videos, you got to watch my video where I talked about who's doing all the killing in the Bible. It ain't Satan. Satan ain't killing nobody in the Bible. It's all god killing people but it ain't the god you think what you think is the god that's this almighty all-knowing all-powerful omnipotent source is actually a masquerader a person wearing a mask and i do mean person a god with a lowercase g you're talking about marduk which is also amun ra and you're also talking about enlil who's also known as yahweh in the bible okay <clears throat> let me get back to my thing here so pretty interesting stuff this is tablet number five that was discovered in the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq from the Enuma Elish. And there's another epic called the Atrahasis epic, which backs up the Enuma Elish and literally talks about the fact that the, the, the theory behind, not the story, theory, but the story behind these two, uh, these two uh, ancient records is that there were some gods, a.k.a. Anunnaki. They did, the word Anunnaki is actually in the Enuma Elish. The name, their name is actually in the Enuma Elish. By the way, for people who are saying, I never, I never seen the word Anunnaki anywhere. Well, look, go look up the Enuma Elish and the name Anunnaki and Nibiru also exist in both. Matter of fact, the name Anunnaki is in the Bible. They call them the Anak in the Bible. They say in, we were grasshopper. They were, we were grasshoppers in their eyesight. That's how, that's how big these beings were. But anyway... In these two accounts, in these two ancient tablets, they talk about the fact that beings came from another planet to Earth because their planet was running low on resources. They were having some serious problems there. They came here to research, research and, re and use resources from this Earth and bring them back to their home planet, but also to create a breakaway civilization in this solar system, which they did. They created another level of another Atlantis on this uh, planet as a breakaway civilization, and they would communicate back and forth to their home planet and even other star systems that existed where they all hailed from 
whether it was Orion, whether it was Adelbron, whatever, they had communication devices that they would use. They, they had these tablets of destiny that we used to communicate back and forth through space. And, all, and they also have some type of level of technology, which I talk about in the Black Knight Satellite documentary that I did, which you can watch on Forbidden Knowledge TV. Now, they worked themselves. They had a working class of, I would say, volunteers that were doing the work from their home planet. They call them the EGG. These were the lower gods, they called them. They were people that were the grunt workers, the middle class people, as we, we would call them probably on Earth. They did a lot of the, the mining, uh, digging channels, digging canals, building uh, buildings and structures and whatever they needed. They did it. They did this for about 200,000 years on their own. In other words, they never used human beings. They were using their own back labor, their own sweat and tears. They had machines called that was crunches and that was crushes. They would use those machines to dig holes and all kind of stuff and and everything else. And these beings got pissed. They were mining on Earth and on Mars. And they got really angry because they were saying they needed to get a break. And they were being forced to continue to work without breaks, without rest, without um, they didn't have women. They were complaining about they had no women. And they were getting pissed off. They decided to go to war against Enki and Lil and Anu, the kings of Earth. And uh, and Anu was the father of Enki and Enlil. So they, they came from Mars. A group of them came from Mars to Earth. These are the gods that fell from heaven to Earth. That's what it means. To go to war against, to rebel against God. In the Bible is what it says, to rebel against God. They were rebelling against the head god, the head chief god, Anu. And uh, the only way that this war was stopped was the fact that they said, okay, Enki says, I have an idea that could stop this. There is, an, a, there is an existing hominid on this planet, existing being on this planet. We can add our essence to it and get it to hold and bear the load of the labor. And he was saying adding essence. He's talking about doing a genetic modification, adding their DNA, maybe unplugging some of our own DNA, making us into like, uh, hominid robots for them to do the late labor and the work. And so this was agreed upon to stop the potential coup in the war. And these beings then started gen genetically manipulating our cousins that were already here on this planet Earth. They already, We were already here. We were seated on this planet by some Pleiadians. If you don't believe me, talk to the, uh, talk to the aboriginals. The aboriginals' verbal handed down history for thousands of years is that they were seated on this planet by people from the Pleiades to protect the race and save the race from the galactic war that was going on. So Earth, before the Anunnaki got here, the ones that became Atlanteans, before they got here, we were already here. Earth is an abandoned seed colony. We were an abandoned seed colony before they got here. They didn't even mess with us for quite some time. But about 200,000 years ago, they decided to tinker with us, genetically modify us, turn us into biological robots to do their labor. And how did they get us to fall for this? After genetically modifying us, disconnecting some of our DNA, that's why we have junk DNA, they went ahead and uh, let me just pull my... They went ahead uh, and and began to uh, modify, modify our DNA. And then once they created what they want a version of us we they, we weren't created from dust once they created a version of us that they actually wanted that can do the workload and everything else and be obedient how did they do this they inserted something called a worship gene into the human genome let me tell you that again they inserted a worship gene into the human genome yes you heard me correct we've already found it Bio biologists and scientists have already discovered people who've researched the gene, a human genome, they've already discovered the gene and it can be turned on and it can be turned off. <laughs> so when they turn the gene off, the person doesn't have the need or want to worship anything on the outside anymore. When they turn the gene on, the person goes back to wanting the a feeling of wanting to worship something on the outside. So they inserted a worship gene into us and that way they could actually trick us into doing the workload by not thinking we were being enslaved, but by making us think that they were gods. Each one of these beings ruled over particular regions 
And those people didn't have any way of traveling, didn't have any way of getting around the planet. So for the most part, the person that was ruling over them, that was God to them, whichever one that was, right? Whether it was Marduk, whether it was uh, Enki, whether it was Enlil, whoever it was, Thoth, they believed these people were gods. Now, what's interesting about Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, is what he calls himself, this guy right here. All right, he's always depicted with the head of an ibis bird, even though he had a human face. He was the only one, uh, him, and him, him and Enki were the only two, actually, that said, no, we're sons of Atlantis. And, uh, you know, so they told the humans that they were not gods, but everyone else, oh, they ate it up. Listen, they were like, yes, I'm your God. Bow to me, pray to me, bring me burnt offerings. And so they literally had humans out here grinding and working Backbreaking labor, doing the taking on the bearing the workload that they themselves used to have to do, and the humans doing it willingly because they thought it was an honor to their gods. So they were enslaved, but didn't know they were even slaves, which is the best slave you can create. Look at what they have today in our modern society. We have a modern slave trade going on every single day, especially in places like America, right? How? Well, you have this fake currency system, this fiat currency, money that doesn't even exist. It's just pieces of paper with conscious attributed value to it. And these people have you thinking that without that fake source of uh, what we call currency, that's no really nothing but paper. Without this paper, you can't have a good life. <laughs> you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. You can't have a nice car. You can't have a nice a nice house, right? You can't uh, afford to buy food for yourself until you have this imaginary green paper in your hands. And when you have that imaginary green paper, somehow magically, you can do all these things. And so to get this green paper, you got to work and you got to work hard and you got to work hard nonstop and you got to grind 24-7. We're all enslaved. We're all, we've all been enslaved in a system where now what is the God is the monetary system. And the monetary system has us basically doing the work and we're doing the work and doing the work and doing the work. And we think it's because we have to have that. We have to have that, those papers, those green papers, or we can't do anything. That's the kind of system they put us into. So we've, we've been enslaved through a fiat fake currency system. That's just one way we've been enslaved. We've also been enslaved through religion. That's another control system that they put on top of us. And then we've also been enslaved by the political system, another enslavement. There is no such thing as a d Democrat or Republican. There's no such thing as a Democrat or Republican. Those people are masquerading as your God, period, point blank. The only thing that does exist is a group of psychopathic oligarchs that destroy the world and kill and torture women and children and men worldwide. That's what does exist. You want to call them a politician, I call them destroyers. All of them. And so you have to understand this, guys. These, are, these people are copying the ancient tradition of masquerading as a god, literally. Let's look about this translation before I get a little bit more into this. George Smith, okay? He was an English Assyriologist, apprentice engraver, but self-taught in cuneiform in the corridors of the British Museum, and eventually he was hired by Sir Henry Rawlinson, a prominent archaeologist, and Smith achieved worldwide attention when he discovered an account of the flood, which has obvious biblical parallels, in 1872. Uh, it was in the Chaldean account of the deluge. This book expands on the previous work and presents numerous translations of tablets, including the first print appearance of the Gilgamesh epics. This guy was translating cuneiform tablets and Assyrian and Babylonian in the 1800s, guys. Like I said, long before Zachariah Sitchin exists. E.A. Spicer. In 1926, E.A. Spicer won a Guggenheim Fellowship to study the remains of the ancient Mitanni and Hurons in, the, in Mesopotamia. While there, in 1927, he discovered the Tepe Guara, uh, one of the world's earliest cradles of civilization. And in 1928, he was appointed assistant professor of Semitics at the University of Pennsylvania and full professor in 1931. 
He was a field director of the Joint Excavation of the American Schools of the Oriental Research and the University Museum from 1930, 1932, 1936, 1937, undertaking excavations in Tepe Guara and Tele Billa. He also translated the Hurrian legal text found at Nutsi. After the war, he returned to the University of Pennsylvania, where he was chairman of the Department of Oriental Studies from 1947 until his death in 1965. He was also appointed Ellis Professor of Hebrew and Semitic Language and Literatures in 1954. He translated and wrote extensive commentary for the volume on Genesis in the Anchor Bible series and was one of the editors of the Torah and the New Jewish Publication Society of America version of the Old Testament. A noted student of his, uh, Mosh Greenberg, became an Israel Prize Laureate in Biblical Studies. This man also translated the ancient Akkadian and Babylonian cuneiform tablets. So when I give you these type of credentials and receipts, you got to understand these tablets, oh, they're real. They're real. Don't think these tablets are fake out here. They're real. Leonard William King also translated. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Look at his look at some of his works. First Steps in Assyrian, a book for beginners, being a series of historical and mythological, religious, magical epistolary and text printed in cuneiform characters with interlinear transliteration and translations, a sketch of Assyrian grammar, sign list and vocabulary. This guy was doing this back in the 1800s as well. Leonard William King. All right. Look at his letters and inscriptions. Look at his work. Letters and inscriptions of Hammurabi. Encyclopedia Biblica. He's a contributor in 1903. Egypt and Western Asia in the light of recent discoveries, 1907. Chronicles concerning early Babylonian kings, 1907. Legends of Babylon and Egypt in relation to Hebrew translation, tradition. I mean, I can go on and on and on. These guys are the ones who translated these texts and these tablets. So... When I tell you that they've been translated for a very long time, we've been known what they are. It's not a secret anymore. We know. And anyone can translate these tablets. If you're saying, well, I want to know if Billy's telling the truth, go to the CDLI Cuneiform Digital Library online. It's, it's hosted by UCLA. And you can take a stone tablet off the virtual shelf and drop it into the translator and read the tablet for yourself. You can read them yourself. You don't even need me anymore. And you can get your own translation and come up with your own idea about what's going on. All right. I give you the receipts, guys. That's what I do. Irving Finkel is another expert in cuneiform and Babylonian. He teaches how to actually do is an amazing video online. You can check out. He teaches how to actually write in cuneiform uh, on stone tablets. And when they're getting into here, you know, the Torah, which means law of God. So some people say, well, where are all these people, these beings that you're talking about? How come we don't see them in any of the texts? Well, they're actually in these ancient texts. Their names are right there. Nobody's ever paid attention to it. You have the Torah, which talks about these masquerading gods. There's ones that genetically modified people that became rulers of, of men that became uh, that ruled over men and became kings of the earth uh, and actually masqueraded as gods telling people to bring them the burnt offerings. The burnt offerings got huge in the time of the Torah, the reign of the Torah, uh, you know, back in the Old Testament era. And what was these burnt offerings? Well, they would bring them slaughtered meat and also bring them, the, you know, the best part of their crops. Why were they doing this? Well, they were doing this because these Anunnaki beings, they're not going to go hunt. They're not about to get out and go hunting for food when they can just tell you that you need to bring this to me so I can answer your prayers and make you bring me a whole, uh, you know, slaughterhouse with the food. And when you go to the ancient temples with me in Egypt, I'm going to show you where they hide, where they would store the meat. So the, the, these Anunnaki people would have the people come to the temple to bring all the offerings. And then they would say, yeah, yeah, we're going to bless you. We're going to pray. We, we're going to take care of you. Yeah, your kid is sick. Okay, he's blessed now. And the people walk away thinking they got this blessing for bringing all this offerings. Meanwhile, there's a storehouse built into the temples where these offerings would go and the meats would get salted and hung to dry for pres preservation. And the other foods would get stored away. And this was the food that they ate. They were, you were literally, they were, when people would come to the temple, they were literally, uh, you know, the Anunnaki were grocery shopping from their couch. It was like the original Amazon or the original Whole Food online shopping system. That's what they was. The original 
uh, Whole Foods online shopping system. They just sit back. Yeah, come pray to me, but bring me all your offerings. And, and, and I, I might bless you with a, you know, I might touch your shoulder or something. And I, might, I might touch your garment, make you feel special. And you, you come back and bring me some more of this food because I, I got to eat next week, too. They were getting pimped by people masquerading as God. I do mean people masquerading as gods. Literally. Where do these people appear? Okay, well, here you go. The ancient Jewish uh, library. You can, go to, you can go to the Jewish virtual library dot org. And just start looking for these people. Here I, did, here I went to the Jewish library dot org. Slash Marduk, M A R D U K. That's Amen Ra. Amen Ra. Okay. And then I just said, find all the accounts of Marduk in the Jewish text. <laughs> this is just one page. There must be about 30 or 40 occurrences here. I can't even, I don't even know where the counter is on this, but I think it's up here in the corner. Okay. You can clearly see here that, uh, that this guy is well known. Amon Ra is masquerading as gods here. Let me see something. Hold on a second. I was trying to see if I can blow that up so I can uh, read it out to you. But let me do it a different way. So hold on a sec. Let me open this up here. Now let me. I almost got to get ready for this next podcast. I'm running out of time. Hold on a second. I'm almost done, though. Okay, let's take a look at this. Although known as a minor god, as early as the third millennium, Marduk became an important local deity at the time of the advent of the first Babylonian dynasty. Marduk was given a god title at a very, very young age. He was um, one of the Anunnaki. He was the son of Enlil. I'm sorry, the son of Enki. He was the son of Enki, brother of Thoth, the Atlantean. And he actually started a war to allow himself to take over kingship of the earth ahead of his scheduled arraignment, a scheduled time to be a king of the planet earth. You got to read these ancient texts, man. This stuff is wild. This stuff is wild. You can't make this stuff up. There's nobody sitting around in ancient times saying, you know what, I'm, gonna make a, I'm, I'm about to make me a good sci-fi movie and start writing all this cuneiform stuff and, and make a good Star Wars flick out of this for the future. There's nobody sitting around doing that. There's nobody sitting around doing that. These people were real people that existed. And so you have the Epic of Atrahasis, which talks about the Apsu, which talks about the oldest beings and their progenitors, where Tiamat is and would become the earth. Mumu, the son steward of his house, which is um, uh, how, you know, the Enuma the, the, the is kind of really describing the celestial battle. You have Marduk, which is also known as Nibiru, because he wanted to be known as the destroyer and a planet from heaven. And Marduk is used here to represent a planet called heaven because he was given the power by the leadership of the gods. Uh, so this text was no doubt named it to him when he had a rulership of the actual earth. Who's ruling the earth right now? Right now, the ruler of the earth is the earth. Amun-Ra is still ruling the earth right now. The symbol of Pisces, which looks like the fish that you see Christians driving around with on the back of their cars, they think that represents the fish that Jesus used to feed the multitude. It's actually incorrect. That symbol of Pisces is the era of the king, the beginning of the kingship of Amun-Ra, the people that they all say amen to. He said, at the end of every prayer, you shall give me thanks. That's why everybody says amen at the end of their prayer, because of Amun-Ra, a.k.a. Marduk, or some people like to call him Marduk. These beings came here. They literally said, you know what? We got a great situation. These humans, 
don't understand exactly what we are, how advanced we are. They think that we're gods because we're more advanced than them. We're, what, the things that we do appear to be like magic. There's a scene out of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth where Thoth, uh, he descends in a great ship down into the land of Kem. This is where uh, ancient Africa, ancient, this, this is ancient, super ancient, long before the modern Egyptian dynasties even existed. He sees the great flood waters are residing. He takes a ship there. He descends from the sky down to the land. When he opens the door to the ship, the, he says that the barbarians came at him with cudgels and spears, seeking to utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. It was him and his crew. They wanted to destroy them. They, they, they were scared. They're like, you're on our territory, man. We don't know what you are, who you are, but we're about to take care of business over here, man. You're going to go down. We'll figure out who you are later after we kill you. So Thoth raised his staff and he sent out a ray of vibration, which froze these people like stone in the mountain. He had technology that literally stopped them in their tracks, a frequency weapon, which we have the same exact frequency weapon today. It's called the active denial system in the military. Look it up, the active denial. It sends out a ray of vibration, which will stop you in your tracks. And depending on the frequency tuning, it can make you feel like you're vomiting. It can make you feel like you're sick. It can make you feel like you're on fire. It can put you in excruciating pain. They can even send voices into your head. Okay? Active denial is the same exact thing that Thoth had back then. Now, what's interesting, when he released him from this device and he walked over to them and said, hey, I'm, I'm a son of Atlantis. He didn't say I'm God. He's one of the very few people that didn't say he was God. He said, I'm a son of Atlantis. Sometimes he even calls himself the son of man. Sound familiar? That's what Yeshua used to call himself in the, in the New Testament. Anyway, so he... um. He says, look, let me show you that I have some things here that I can help you. And he started showing him some of his doodads, his technology pieces, and the people started groveled at his feet, started praying to him. He says, no, stand up. Guys, I'm a son of Atlantis. In other words, I'm not God. He's one of the only ones that did this. That's why I have so much respect. He could have went on ahead and masqueraded as a God like his relatives did. He decided not to do that. He decided not to take on the role of a god and become an intelligencer, a person that teaches. And he went around the planet teaching human beings languages, technology, building techniques, and everything else. There's his, his relatives, though, they literally made people pray to them. They, uh, you know, they made people worship them. They made people bring them burnt offerings. And all this made it into the modern-day Bible. And all these people that are running around saying all these, reading all these verses and doing all these prayers don't realize they're praying to fake gods. They're not praying to the creator of the universe at all. Not even close. I mean, heck, when you call on Jesus, you're calling on Zeus anyway. You're calling on, you're saying hail Zeus. So we're running out of time here now for this podcast, guys. But you got to stay with us because I'm going to keep going. I'm coming right back on here. I'm going to end this and turn it right back on again because we're going to start the Biohack Your Best Life podcast right now. Thanks for coming on tonight to talk to, to let me talk about this. Uh, and I want you to share this link with as many people as you can, because it shows you that people came here in the ancient past that were not gods, that didn't create the universe, that were flesh and blood people like you and I, that put their pants on one leg at a time like you and I. And I can go deeper into this at another time where I'm talking about the wars of the gods, the wars in the Bible, and who started these wars. And like I said before, who's doing all the killing in the Bible? You know, you've got to check that video out. It's on this account. Check out that video. Is it God or Satan? You'll be very surprised to find out it's not Satan. All right. And I bring you the receipts as well. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. Thanks for signing on tonight. The podcast is, I talked to him in the, in the beginning. The, bot, the next podcast I'm coming on right back on is about mushrooms and fungi. And we're going to go deep into the science of mushrooms and fungi, the healing properties. We're going to go into the science behind uh, mushrooms and fungi, uh, some of the capabilities that it has, how it can control people, how it can control insects. We're going to talk a lot about this, how it connects the entire planet and makes an Internet. We're going to talk about some amazing topics right now, coming right back in just a few short minutes. All right. Peace.